Pego's been pretty clear about the fact that there's they kind of speak in bins, and they have only so many bins that they can put pieces into at a given time. And so when they're going through a production run, they have to keep in mind that, you know, let's say notionally there's 20 bins that they can fill. They have to, when they're designing their sets, maximize the repeated occurrence of that piece so that they're, they're maximizing the utility of all of those pieces in play. Hello, bricks, chicks, and minifigures. You are listening to A Falls Welcome, where we talk all things Lego from the perspective of two adult collect- collectors. We are your co host. I'm Grinch. And I'm Wes. And welcome to another episode. Today, we're going to be talking about the value of Lego and hopefully answer the question or come to a conclusion on if Lego is getting more expensive as time goes on. But before we get that, I'm going to pass it to West, who's going to kind of go over just a quick update about the podcast. Welcome, everybody. This is our first episode. We've had a few practice episodes, uh, but this is the first one that we're releasing publicly. So I just wanted to review the framework for episodes. We'll start off with some public service announcements, followed by exciting Lego news, a main topic, what we're building this week, Brick mail, and then we'll end the episode with final thoughts uh, and uh, an outro. Uh, so that's our episode flow. As for uh, our release schedule, we're working to try to release each a new episode every week. Expect them out on Mondays. Both Grinch and I are uh, working professionals, so if there's something uh, in our lives that disrupt that, please bear with us. But that's our intent and plan for this first season. So without further ado, welcome to episode one. All right. So I think now we're going to go ahead and move over to some exciting Lego news. Uh, In this segment, we really just kind of highlight the different pieces of news that happened since our last episode and just kind of talk about them. We're not we're not a news podcast necessarily, so we're not going to be talking about every single thing that happened in the world of Lego, just stuff that kind of got us excited about Lego throughout the week. So with that, let's go to our next segment. Exciting Lego news. And West, why don't you uh, get us started off? What uh, news uh, did you want to talk about that happened this past week? Well, some exciting Lego news I saw this week. Uh, It's Valentine's Day or the week of Valentine's Day. And so there was some excitement over the new Lego Roses release. Grinch, have you seen that one? I sure did. Yeah, the big floral arrangement. Yeah, it looks great. Uh, they've continued to just crush it with their Lego plant sub uh, theme. Uh, I think that falls under icons, if I'm not mistaken, or creator expert, however that plays out these days. But the theme has just continued to push the boundaries of Lego, making them look more and more like realistic plants. And I know it has brought a lot of people who have been maybe traditionally outside of the Lego uh, enterprise, if you will, into the fold, especially as adult uh, collectors. I've seen them around the office. I've seen them um, out in stores that you wouldn't expect. And so, yeah, that botanical theme has just really been crushing it. And so this Lego Roses set has definitely continued that uh, rise uh, and exposure. But the really cool thing that I saw this week was that in the Battersea uh, shopping mall in London, Lego opened up a little Lego florist stand called Le Floriste. And at that stand, you can buy flowers made of Lego. And that's the only Lego that you can buy there. And so I was looking up some more details about it. Grinch, you have the YouTube link in front of you of somebody's video of that stand. You can see it's it's a small kind of cart with a bunch of um, barrels and, and crates around it and just filled with Lego sunflowers and Lego roses and all of the different botanical themes. Uh, what was really interesting is that uh, Brickmaster Jamie is actually there uh from the weeks or from the days of the 2nd of february through the 18th of february so if you're listening to this on monday you're one day late apologies uh, but he was there uh the, the stand uh meeting fans and talking about that sub theme uh which is really exciting 
And Grinch, did you have anything else uh, kind of on Valentine's Day or anything else? Did uh, Mrs. Grinch get some Legos for Valentine's Day? Uh, no Legos for Valentine's Day, but we did the traditional flowers and spent way too much on roses. And it does make you, you know, when you see real roses, it does make you appreciate that Lego rose set a little bit more uh, just because they've kind of captured just different budding, you know, phases of the rose. Um, some are more open, some are more closed. And it's just, it's just kind of really cool to see just how far Legos come with their techniques and actual ability to sculpt things. Absolutely. Now they just need to work on some other colors because while red roses are classic, you know, there's definitely room for white and yellow and other varieties of roses too. So maybe that's something a mock designer can create on the side. Give them, give them a couple years when uh, the botanical collection needs a refresh and they'll be like, you know what, let's do yellow roses now. <laughs> uh, no, but I did see some news that I was personally very excited. I, I've, I've, you know, uh, shamefully admitting, I guess, I, I don't know. I've never actually bought any of the botanical collections. I don't have any of them. Uh, just nothing that's really kind of piqued my interest, but uh, I'm not always the intended audience for uh, a certain Lego collection or anything like that. So um, I, I've actually never bought those, but something I do collect a lot of is Marvel. And I did see that they leaked or uh, you know have leaked that uh, the Milano is coming out. Uh, so I've, I've seen a couple comments already that have been like, but we already got one of these. And just to clarify, the ship that we got that was the UCS was the Benatar, which was the kind of new guardian ship from Infinity War. The Milano, of course, is known from being from the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, and it was destroyed uh, in the second Guardians of the Galaxy movie. So um, it's a cool ship. It's actually the, the kind of traditional system one brick built one that we got with the first guardians is one of my like most underrated marvel sets of all time it's just a really awesome set so i'm excited to see what they do here of course no images leaked yet just the fact that we're getting this milano and uh, yeah couldn't be more excited for that yeah i i'm not a huge lego marvel collector or fan but I really did like the Benatar and the sculpting that they did on the the wing of the Benatar on that kind of Ultimate Collector Series model. And so I, I'm excited to see what they do with a larger Milano and, and what they can put together. And I'm just looking at pictures of the you know Milano set, the one that came out from, it looks like, the second um, movie. Uh, and it, I mean, you know, it looks great. Like, it, this is the Milano versus Abelisk uh, set yeah. 76081. It looks fine. Um, but I, you know, I'm, like I said, really excited to see what they can put together with a little more attention to detail and with a little bit of the better sculpting techniques that Lego has been introducing over the last few years. It's really exciting to get a rehash on that. And, uh, everything they've been doing with the Marvel's line recently has just been fantastic. So keep it up, Lego. Yeah. That Milano too, the, the one from Guardians 2, they actually did an orange color. It was orange and blue. But the original one that they did from the first movie is the one that is that kind of dark horse of like a top five Marvel set because you can actually open the top of it and there's you can fit six figures in that set. It had like I think it was like I, I don't don't remember off the top of my head, but I think it was like 600 and something pieces when it came out. And as we're going to talk all about value today, you know, maybe this isn't the best way to measure the value, but it was about 600 something pieces when it came out. And it was like it was like. Actually, it might have been 700 or 800 pieces and it was like 60 bucks. It was just a phenomenal deal for a ship, super detailed. And then they came out with that one from Guardians 2, which was, in my opinion, a huge downgrade from it. So um, hopefully they redeemed themselves from that one. And uh, I'm, I'm just excited for it. Yeah, no, it definitely looks great. And uh, well, I mean, the old one still looks great and it'll be exciting to see what they can put together. For our last piece of Lego, exciting Lego news this week, I just wanted to very quickly touch on the Lego Speed Champions theme. We got some pictures of the new McLaren F1 car that they're releasing mm -hmm. this year. And it's a smaller version of the Technic one that they released two years ago, I believe. And so that's really exciting to just get that in a smaller one. Last year they came out with the Mercedes, or two years ago they came out with the Mercedes F1 car. And so now... 
with this McLaren one, you'll have a McLaren F1 car and a Mercedes F1 car, and they're both in the modern F1 design. And so while they technically wouldn't race against each other, being two models from two separate years, uh, Mercedes would theoretically have a more updated model. It does allow Speed Champions collectors to have two F1 cars from two very distinct teams racing against each other, which is really exciting. And there's also something kind of new that they're doing this year. The Speed Champions sub-theme uh, hasn't really, this year, announced any sort of movie cars, which is a, you know, a little sad. The three that they announced last year, they released last year, were great. But what they are doing this year, which they haven't done in a while, is that they're releasing another SUV, and that's really exciting. They're releasing a Mercedes G-Wagon, apparently, this summer. Uh, that's what the rumor is, and so it's exciting just to get another one of those sets. I think one of our next episodes uh, in the future is going to talk about scaling. And in large, I am a huge fan of the eight wide scale, but there are some issues with it. And I'm not a huge fan of it entirely. And we'll, we'll certainly talk about it then. But I am excited to see what a Mercedes G Wagon in the Speed Champions treatment looks like. So, yeah, that is so my it was. Exciting. Was, uh, was the last one uh, that came out, the last SUV that came out, the Ford Bronco? There was the Ford Bronco okay. and then the Lamborghini Urus that came okay. out as well. Oh my gosh, uh, somebody, so are... somebody at my office actually, not my office, like they don't work with me, but somebody in like my office park has a Lamborghini Urus. And every time I go yeah. outside and there, I'm like, oh, this person's here again. <laughs> I, I actually, like, this is a hot take. And has nothing to do with Lego, but has everything to do with the Lamborghini Urus. Think those supercar SUVs are the stupidest thing in the world. And here's why: if you look at a Lamborghini Urus, there is a Buick that they just released this year that looks almost identical. And so, if you're the owner of a Lamborghini, great, your car is going to be mistaken for a Buick. And if you look at the Ferrari that they announced this year, it looks a lot like a Mazda. Mm. And so, you're paying. 10 times the amount of a Mazda for what is essentially just a Mazda. I mean, it just the, the SUVs are dumb. Isn't so it just luxury but, brands in general. Aren't you just paying for the name half the time anyways? Well, you would hope that a brand like Ferrari or Lamborghini that is known for performance as well mm. is providing the performance, but this really feels like a Ferrari branded phone case, if you will, versus like an actual, Ferrari, you know what I mean? Like, well, this you heard it the... here first, folks. Uh, we're <laughs> we're excited for the first Ferrari minivan to come out, so that uh, you can roll into soccer practice in style. I mean, that's basically what a Cadillac Escalade is. You know? No. True. Like, True. Good trim package, I guess. Uh, all right. Yeah. So enough about real cars. Here, we don't like to talk about things that are real. We like to talk about Lego. All right, so some more exciting LEGO news. I, I didn't want to miss over it. I can't believe we, we forgot about it up front was the LEGO Medieval uh, market was just announced. Super exciting. The GOAT is back. It, this time it's in dark gray. I know we just got in the collectible minifigures, but this is kind of the initial set that it initially came out when I think back in 2005 when the GOAT was first released. So cool to, to kind of you know get it back. That survey that was kind of leaked, I think this time last year, was correct. I didn't believe, honestly, that survey even was real. And they said we would be getting a medieval market. That makes me really excited that we'll probably get Baradur in the future, too. I know there's been a couple rumors and leaks about that set. It was on that initial survey. Uh, but this market looks absolutely great. We had the official reveal. Um, it, it also looks like they kind of went along the same style and build as the uh, castle, the anniversary castle that we got. So I think it'll look really nice on display with that. Uh, and, and they use kind of some similar building techniques, similar like building structures and aesthetics to kind of match that. So definitely kind of will add to that overall kind of updated castle theme. I hope we get a couple more of these things. Uh, luckily, I was able to get that blacksmith shop right before it retired. Uh, that would have been one that got away if I hadn't have done that. And I'm glad I did because it seems like Lego's kind of starting to revisit this kind of castle in medieval air, which I am all for. Uh, but I think that wraps up our exciting Lego news or our Lego news for this week. Let's go ahead and transition over to the main topic. Today's topic. 
So this week's topic, this episode's topic, is all about the value of Lego. And I'm sure you've heard it before. Oh, Lego's getting more expensive. And really kind of when West and I were talking about it, it does feel that way at times, right? But we've noticed there was a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence out there. It's a lot of, hey, I feel like Lego's getting more expensive. Uh, I've also kind of personally noticed that people are kind of comparing it to maybe the year before or a few years before or maybe when they were a child and now they're an adult collector of Lego and they're like, holy crap, Lego's so much more expensive than it used to be. I mean, I know if I compared how much I spend now on Lego than when I was a child, it would be you know, infinite times higher because I didn't buy that when I was a child. My my parents did. So, you know, when you're actually out there earning money and, you know, making a living and then having to buy this, it can inherently feel more expensive because all of a sudden you're like, I got to go to the grocery store. Oh my gosh, I also have to go get this awesome Lego set, but it's $200. So what we wanted to do was just kind of look at some of the data and really determine, you know, what's the proper way to kind of look at the value of Lego. There's a lot of different ways, you know, you can look at the value of just a product in general, you know, inherently to an individual. I may like Lego more because I'm a collector of it and I see some future value in certain sets where I'm like, okay, uh, for example, the Disney 100 anniversary um, camera set, I just picked that up recently and that has a Walt Disney minifigure in it. And I can promise you that set will be worth way more than it is right now when it retires in a shorter amount of time. Now, this is not a investing conversation, but when some people look at Lego, they do kind of take that into consideration of like, okay, what's the value today and what could be the value in the future? Um, So that's kind of one aspect of it. Uh, Nostalgia is a big factor of value, right? Or, Or even, you know, the actual mechanical uh, use of a product is also another way to measure the value. Is it valuable as an item of play? I'm an adult. I don't necessarily sit here and and play with my Milano UCS ship. And so I don't have hours and hours of time spent flying that thing around shooting the bad guys. But I'm also an adult and I spend a lot of time staring at a computer all day. And I value any sort of hobby that allows me to disconnect and kind of get out of the real world of paying the bills and, you know, sitting, analyzing stuff at a desk. So uh, I find a ton of value in that. So um, those are just kind of some kind of anecdotal ways that individuals can have value of Legos. But in this discussion specifically, I think we were really focused more on the actual monetary value of Lego, of current Lego sets on the current market. Uh, Wes, do you have anything to add to that? No, I I mean, I think the conversation is, it's challenging, right? The, like you said, anecdotally, it feels like the topic of Lego value continues to be brought up as Lego is getting more expensive. And, and certainly you have to take into account like what the current market conditions are. So over the last few years, right, we've just gotten through uh, a you know, global shift and, and adjustment to the market that it hasn't seen in a, a long, long time. Uh, with a fairly significant global event that occurred uh, and that that really changed the economic landscape across the board for better or for worse. And here in the United States, we saw a rise in inflation uh, that has slowly started to dissipate as uh, our paychecks have caught up to the adjusted value of goods and services. Certainly, there's been some uh, elasticity in that price. And so some prices we've seen have fallen. Some we've kind of seen stay the same, but our our paychecks have slowly caught up to that change in price. And so it's hard to say for sure without any concrete data what's going on. Uh, And and hopefully we will address that question today. I think we will uh, to some extent. You know, I I don't know if we have anything conclusive, but we certainly, uh, I think, can provide some strong evidence towards uh, one train of or line of thinking versus maybe another but in addition to and and as we'll look at with the data you know the sets that are being released today are far different than the sets that were released in 20 2001 for example and you know for the listener you guys may or may not ever get a chance to listen to our practice episodes but we talked about the rock raiders theme and the western theme and we looked at the price per pieces for those theme And they really weren't far off from the price per pieces that we are seeing today. But what was different was the average 
cost of that theme per set. There were a lot of $20 sets. There was a lot of $10 sets. There was maybe one or two sets over $50 in each theme. It wasn't a, a hugely expensive theme. Whereas these days, the sets are getting bigger. We, we actually have concrete data to show that the number of, of sets being released by LEGO over the last five years has increased significantly in comparison to, for example, say, 2000. And so as LEGO has increased its portfolio and as it has shifted some of its attention towards, for example, like the adult themes, uh, it just stands to reason that as an adult collector of Lego, I would start to see higher value or higher price tags all around me versus when I was younger and collecting smaller sets. And so I think this is really a reactionary feeling based on that exposure uh, to those higher themes versus any sort of uh, shift in Lego pricing in general. But I don't want to steal too much of your thunder for the conversation today. We're going to kind of talk about that with some data in front of us in, in just a second. Uh, so I did want to just jump in because I know uh, Wes said a word here, elasticity of pricing, and I wanted to just kind of level set for for all the listeners in case uh, i mean i have an mba but i don't think everybody out there listening necessarily has an mba uh and i know um uh, wes also has uh furthered his education too uh, and has a graduate degree so i wanted to just level set for some of these terminologies uh from like a professional and like realistic business world perspective and then also just from like a lego hobby perspective so i uh, wanted to kind of kind of talk about some common measures so when you talk about price elasticity what that's referring to is the demand for a good as the price changes so for example if your price increases you, t you expect actually to see the demand decrease or as the price lowers you expect to see you know the demand change a little bit there too whereas price inelasticity means that as the price changes the demand does not change and it seems you know for lego at least right getting in the mind of corporate lego here which full disclosure neither of us work for lego we work for totally different companies um, but if you if you try to get in the mind of lego here Lego's more popular than it's ever been, and the and and the prices so on so quote unquote are going up, right? And we'll talk about what that actually means if like the prices are going up. But for Lego's perspective, as the prices have gone up, the demand has stayed relatively the same, right? So they're kind of looking at it as well. Our products very inelastic as prices increase, right? As we get higher prices on the shelf, more and more people are actually buying these sets, and and you can see it with their strategy too. We'll kind of talk a little bit about how. You know, over time, more Lego sets have actually come out. I think you mentioned that. And we talked about like the bouquet and the, the botanical collection. I think that's a perfect example of where Lego has really dabbled into these kind of sub themes or themes that they necessarily wouldn't touch before to kind of get more outsiders into the actual Lego portfolio, into the hobby of Lego. And I think the botanical collection is a perfect example. Another one would be like the Dune set, right? Where they've got this giant dune ornithopter for an ip that they traditionally probably wouldn't really touch right i mean i couldn't have imagined them making a dune lego set but what they're doing is they're just kind of branching out branching the theme out getting it in front of more people by doing these one-off sort of lego kind of licensed themes or, or collections that will help kind of just spread the world of lego and get people to try it that might not necessarily try it um so another kind of common measure that I did want to talk about too is um, price per part ratio. So we'll hear, you'll hear us talk quite a bit about that today. So when we're talking about price per part, uh, that just means the price that it would cost per piece in a Lego set. So for example, if you bought an $100 Lego set for a thousand, with that had a thousand pieces in it, that would have a price to part ratio of 10 cents per piece. And traditionally, or, you know, anecdotally however you want to put it lego fans have had this ideation of 10 cents per piece is like a good value so a lot of times what you'll see is people will look at a price to part and say oh my gosh this set has 1500 pieces and it's a hundred dollars that's a that's a price apart of eight dollars or eight cents per part that's really good this is a good value whereas if you look at a set that might have you know 500 pieces and be a hundred dollars and all of a sudden you're like wow this is a terrible price per part it's 15 cents per part this is disgusting um and and 
I what, what we're here to say is that's not necessarily a fair judgment, right, on how to val judge value of a set. And it's also not necessarily a fair judgment to say, like, oh, Lego sets are getting more expensive because I anecdotally feel like, oh, this has a bad price to part ratio. It's just one of their sets in their portfolio, right? So, Wes, am I leaving anything out? No, no, I think this, you've pretty much covered it. I mean, I think we could probably talk about different methodologies for assigning value for, for Lego. Um, you know, you mentioned price per piece. We've entertained the idea of trying to kind of come up with like a price per weight or mass as like a, as a you know, measurement of value. That's kind of difficult. Uh, the data sets that we're using off of uh, Brickset and Brick Economy don't actually get into that level of detail. Unfortunately, you and I both kind of looked at like a, maybe potentially like a price per density, you know, um, in terms of size of set for, and mass uh, and price as, as a potential, you know, more realistic measurement of value. But unfortunately, it's just really hard to do anything other than price to piece, which uh, still kind of represents probably the best uh, or the most accessible measurement of value in Lego. Although, like I said, we'll, we'll talk about Brickonomics a little later in terms of scarcity and everything else that kind of goes into the secondhand market of Lego sets. But uh, no, Grinch, I think you're right on uh, you're right on the money. I see what you did there. Uh, no, I and I, I actually I'd actually even slightly disagree. I wouldn't necessarily say that price per part is a good way to measure value. I guess my point, and I understand a lot of people use it, I, I think there's so much more that goes into value than just price per part. And when it comes to judging Lego value, we will never know because Lego is a private company. Even if they were a public company, all this information wouldn't necessarily be out there. And we'd have a little bit more of an idea because you'd get a company P&L every earnings report. However, with the private owned company, they, they, they we're at the mercy of them and what they want to release. And and I just, I, I really, one thing I like about Jang Bricks, you know, the king of YouTube, is that whenever he tries to judge value, I don't always necessarily agree with the conclusion that he comes to um, when when he is judging value. But what he likes to look at, at least, is I spent $100 on this, this right here. And I think that's a pretty good way to do it. And sometimes we'll even break it down. Like, I think the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World kind of lines are a great way to, like, say, like, price per part's not correct. And I've got two examples here kind of off the cuff. If you look at that set, the Brachiosaurus came in, right? It was $80 and it was like barely 500 pieces. And all of a sudden, that's a bad price to part ratio. But when you look at what you're getting, you got a, you've got a big tree, you got a big Brachiosaurus that was about the same size of that, you got a truck, and then you got a couple of minifigures. And even then, I kind of come back to them like, that's still a little bit overpriced in my opinion. It should have still been a little bit less. But when you look at the same set or a similar set in the same theme, such as the T-Rex breakout set that we got in 2020, where they had that scene where the T-Rex is breaking out of the fence, that most notably is the only Jurassic Park set that has a brick-built dinosaur in it. And that price to part, if you remove that dinosaur from it, all of a sudden becomes, you know, like 600 pieces to 100 and something dollars. And now you're looking at a very similar price to part ratio as you would traditionally be looking at within that theme had you taken a brick built dinosaur and then just turned it into three pieces like they've done with their larger mold dinosaur. So I really kind of, I really subscribe uh, to the idea of, price per stuff in front of you versus price per part because two like from a business perspective i know we talked about it a little bit in one of our practice episodes but you know the larger the pieces that that are there the actual less amount of plastic right so a piece with more pieces would have a heavier weight to it but what becomes a challenge is that that piece now is that larger piece is more specialized and less usable so uh, for example a dinosaur leg that comes in those sets is only that's a brachiosaurus leg now occasionally they'll reuse the leg for velociraptor for example and the stigmaloc right that's the same leg that's just recolored or could even be the same color for that matter but that's two uh, two occurrences of use whereas when you've got a one by one plate 
in dark blue, all of a sudden you've got, I mean, I think, I, I believe there's like a couple thousand sets that have that specific piece in it. So it's not necessarily that the piece is larger that's the issue. In fact, that larger piece has less plastic in it. It's the fact that it's used less. And then you have to have the piece in the database. You have to manufacture the piece. You have to have the mold. So if you look at how much use you're actually getting out of that specific mold, that's a lot less. You've got to factor in shutting down the entire factory to produce that single piece. Not, you don't shut down the factory. But if you run, you know, if you make two by two bricks on Sundays, for example, and all of a sudden you got to make a dinosaur leg and that piece is just going to be in one set you're missing out on manufacturing those two by two bricks, right? So there's a whole lot of like, you know, operational and manufacturing side that actually goes into the pieces that causes a larger, more specialized or just more specialized piece in general to be way more expensive. Yeah, sure. And that's, I, I think that is still, you know, from an analysis perspective, fairly straightforward. The other thing too, that I think our listeners should keep in mind is Lego has been very public about talking about and question when people have asked them about things, for example, more specialized pieces. Uh, the one that comes to mind would be like a holographic minifigure or, or a translucent minifigure to be like a force ghost or something. Lego has been pretty clear about the fact that there's they kind of speak in bins and they have only so many bins that they can put pieces into at a given time. And so when they're going through a production run, they have to keep in mind that, you know, let's say notionally there's 20 bins that they can fill. They have to, when they're designing their sets, maximize the repeated occurrence of that piece so that they're, they're maximizing the utility of all of those pieces in play. And so Lego as a company is going to be effectively... Um, it's going to be in their best interest to reduce those single use occurrences as much as possible, which is why we do see more specialized pieces or prints, for example, in more expensive sets, because it's worth more to Lego in those situations to produce those pieces because you're paying for it, right, effectively, versus in some of those smaller sets that are beyond the 4 plus line, because I'll be honest, the 4 plus series has been a bit of a a stranger with their non-stickered approach to things. Um, but, you know, in the five plus and up lines, you're going to see smaller sets, more sticker usage versus more specialized parts uh, for that very reason. And I do want to kind of push back that I, I'm not suggesting that price per piece is a good measurement. I'm only suggesting that it's the easiest one that we as sort of an outside observer can use to evaluate the Lego process. I don't mind Jang's approach to value where he kind of looks at the stuff in front of him. Um, but I, I do fear that it is still ultimately subjective. Uh, and... But value is value is inherently objective, right? Because that's what makes things more well, or less right. valuable, right? Right. And so I, I think it's good. I've sometimes I and again, Jang is done a phenomenal job of, of putting Lego out there and his his videos are wonderful. Uh, I watched two of them today. Um, but I, I do think sometimes when he sits there and, and reviews stuff, he certainly is coming at it from his own perspective and his thought process on value. And so things that I see him commonly maybe not addressing enough is, you know, he'll say like, well, there's three minifigures in this set and that's great. Well, okay, are any of them repeats? Are any of them unique, right? Because then from like a Lego perspective, that's going to cost more. And so it's not just enough to say like, well, there's three, so that's about $10. And then the, the vehicle, that's about 15. You have to really, you know, there's more into it. And so again, right, like from a surface level, I don't think it's a bad idea. I, I take your point with like the dinosaur, the brachiosaurus set is like a really good representation of how it probably feels like you're getting $80 worth of Lego, even though the piece count doesn't necessarily show that. But again, right, I think what this kind of hints at is some of the flawed analysis that can occur when we are thinking through this, maybe again, a little more anecdotally. And so I think this is kind of a great point to transition into some of the, the data that we've pulled and that you've put together, Grinch, to, to kind of look at a comparison of sets, uh, pieces uh, over the last few years. And I'm, I'm really excited to kind of dig deep into the conclusions that this data 
draws or you know um, delivers. Yeah, so. and I do, I do want to say one thing real quick, not to like hop to Jang's defense, but I did just want to mention that just because he doesn't necessarily say it in the video doesn't mean he's not thinking that because he doesn't always say, oh, a minifigure is worth $3.33, therefore there's three, so it's $10 worth of minifigures. He might subconsciously be taking that into consideration of like, oh, we got three of the same clone troopers. Like I would normally say that's $10, but this is $5 for me because it's the same freaking you know, thing. Just We just don't know, right? So I do, I do want to just say this, and I think I'm really just saying that because this is such an anecdotal conversation and i love that we're transitioning now to actually get into some of the data because i think that's where we can really start to understand is lego getting more expensive you know we, we i can't sit here and tell you price to part is good or bad i mean i can give you my you know opinion and the da- the data won't necessarily show you know you that's a subjective measurement of oh this is a good way to measure something or this is a bad way to measure something all we can say is if we use that measurement, it's not getting worse over time or it is getting worse over time, right? So yeah. I think I think that's where we're trying to draw like a conclusion. We're not necessarily trying to say, oh, what's the best way to value Lego? What we're kind of saying is this is how you can value it in some different ways. And then this is also what the data is saying when it comes to those different types of value, valuation. And I think if there's any takeaway from what we're going to present next, for example, uh, and we're going to look at it in here in just a second, but if we said that the average price per piece for the 2023 production year was 16 cents, and now we're talking about 2024 sets, we could measure them against the 2023 year's average price per piece, and we could say that it's better or worse than that average. But that's not really the conclusion that some of these Lego presenters and and video bloggers are trying to reach because they're trying to talk about one set. I think this gives us a nice generalization. But as Grinch, as you know, with data science, like the, the broader generalization that you get sometimes is more powerful. And so I think that's really kind of what we are going to end up with our discussion here is is some more broader generalizations and takeaways than maybe anything super specific. Yeah, exactly. And and I spent a ton of time in college with a biology degree and then an MBA degree actually digging into data. We had a subspecialization in data analytics. So I'm really excited to get into this. I wouldn't, okay, I'll say it, I'm a data nerd. I I, I don't know if, have you ever watched those YouTube videos of, it's like data is beautiful and it's just like the, the data graphs over time and it's got like the most popular phones in America or something like that. <laughs> I love those videos. I could literally like watch them all day. So um, let's get, let's, do do we, so we talked about some of the assumptions. You should watch them, by the way. You, you, dude, they're right up your alley. I promise you. Um, Um, Like the box office ones where they talk about like best box office over time, like that stuff's cool. Anyways, um, were there any other incorrect assumptions? Now we're not necessarily drawing any conclusions on the assumptions that occur, right? Price to part ratio, I get it. I get why people use it. I don't necessarily use it. Uh, when I'm sitting there at the Lego store, I'm not like, oh my gosh, this price to part ratio is amazing. I'm going to go buy this set. I'm like, wow, that's a really cool set. Look how they built that set. I bet there's a lot of cool building techniques. I love those minifigures. I want that set, right? And minifigures historically have been actually the data will tell you that collectible minifigures is the worst price to part. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I think the other assumptions i've heard are that the themed sets the ones that have an ip Mm -hmm. uh you have to you're paying a a a disney tax right disney tax people will talk about yeah and so i i think that's probably an assumption that we're gonna see here is is maybe not necessarily correct so um but you know certainly one that we hear all the time um in in terms of the larger you know lego lego enterprise themes yeah, so I did want to uh, level set here with with everybody. A couple things. First of all, when we're talking about price for this conversation, this is not an investment discussion. This is not a kind of collecting retired set discussion. We're purely talking about the price of the product the when it was released on the shelf. So, for example, um, 
you know, we're, we're, the, that Disney 100 set that I mentioned with the Walt Disney and the, and the camera, that's $100. That's what we're referring to. We're not talking about how, you know, the UCS first Millennium Falcon cost a couple thousand, or Cloud City, right? The Cloud City Star Wars set, the original, and even the remake are very, is very expensive now, but the original one's like, so I saw somebody trying to sell it for 10 grand the other day sealed. That's not the price we're talking about. We're talking about the retail price when this product came out. The other thing I did want to mention too, we're not talking about sales price. So for example, the more recent X-Wing, uh, X-Men Starfighter or, or ship that came out, that's uh, 80 or $90. Uh, you'll commonly find for $54 already, even though it just came out in January. We're, we're taking the 80 or the $90 price when it comes to that. So the price Price at release, the the suggested manufactured uh, retail price or recommended retail price, however you want to call it, that's what we're referring to of the year that it was released. A couple other things. When it comes to the data, I did remove a couple of sub-themes. So these are only sets that were available retail. So Comic-Con sets that might have had a value were removed, right? Uh, sets like the Lego education sets or the Lego serious play sets, those are intended to be purchased by a teacher and then used for an educational purpose. So again, when you talk about value, there's a little bit different you know, way to look at value just, just by taking that whole theme, right? So I did remove stuff like that. I removed Duplo, for example, uh, because Duplo is kind of a whole other product line like Scala. I removed that uh, and so I, I did remove kind of those one-off ga Galador, not just a one-off theme, but a, a theme that used a totally different system altogether. I also removed base plate, um, and I don't mean sets with base plates. What I mean is you can buy a base plate, and the reason I removed that is because it will skew the data because that's a one piece for $10. Now, base plates are still taken into consideration when they came out with the set. I think that's fair. Again, how you're judging the value of that set. If you want to go price to part ratio, that base plate's going to severely inflate it. However, just looking at a base plate, for example, saying, oh my gosh, that's $10 per piece is going to just skew the overall data and kind of data that we're trying to share right now. So that was removed by being an outlier. Uh, the other thing that I removed was like nine volt motors, uh, stuff like that, because the motor itself was like fifteen dollars. It's one piece. Again, same same kind of conclusion. Uh, and I also removed Lego gear because those are T-shirts, for example, or the storage containers, <laughs> or you know things like that that aren't necessarily Lego bricks were all removed. The plushies, the to you know the other toys, that stuff is gone. So we're purely talking about Lego system sets and Technic and Bionicle that were released at retail and the price of the year that they came out in, okay? So um, kind of some of the interesting data here, or Wes, did, was there anything else you wanted to touch on with the kind of data collection and process here? No. Um... All right, so uh, if you don't have anything else to add, then uh, we'll kind of get into the data. So what, what we've done here is uh, just taking some data from Brickset by year, and we're actually going all the way back to 1990. Um, I felt like kind of modern Lego has happened since then, so it was a good starting point. You know, what about you? I mean, why 1990? No, I think you you hit it exactly right. 1990 is really the start of kind of the modern themes. Um, coincidentally, it's also kind of the start of us. <laughs> Uh, maybe that's as why. humans <laughs> and uh our our own lego experience it is our own lego podcast so that totally makes sense but yeah the late 80s early 90s you know it, it definitely shows a continuation of the data and i think where we started it wasn't as important as just seeing the trend and so um Let's let's get into it. Yeah, it, it, it's exactly. We wanted to have a large scale of trend here, not just look at like the past five years, for example. So this is 33 years of data. Um, I wanted to start higher level here, West. And uh, can you tell me what you think is the year that the most Lego sets were released in? Well, let's see. I wouldn't be asking you if it was 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Also, this does not include 2024. That's still happening, so can't make Fair any enough. conclusions there. I mean, I think it was more recently. I was, I have the data in front of me, so I haven't seen. Well, okay, now I actually saw the number, but okay. uh, twenty, sometime in the 2020s. Yes, so it was 2021. Um, 
which is ironic because that's like the COVID year, right? But I know a lot of planning goes into this prior to actually releasing these sets. But the first year that the 500 set was eclipsed, the 500 mark was eclipsed, was in 2011, right? And so I think it's exponentially gotten bigger recently. And that's kind of my main point here. So I wanted to start kind of higher level and then we'll work our way down a little bit. So retail price, when do you think was the most, you know, retail set? And by that, I mean, if you bought every single one of those sets that year, when do you think it was the highest? That's tough. I'd say probably, um, again, probably sometime more recently. But what what did you have? It's 2021, same year as the most okay. sets. But what's interesting is in 2020, there's 809 sets. And in 2023, there was 801 sets. I'm going to tell you right now, it co- it cost you more money in 2023 than it did in 2020 to buy almost the same number of sets. And do you know how much it cost in 2023? Uh, right now, I'm seeing thirty thousand, about thirty thousand five hundred dollars. And in 2020, we'll call it twenty four hundred or twenty four thousand. Yeah. Sorry, so almost. Six thousand five hundred more dollars in twenty twenty three than twenty twenty. So if you look at that, you're like, yeah, Lego is getting more expensive, right? It's interesting because if you look at this over time, it's also. I mean, if you go back to nineteen ninety, <laughs> how, how much was it in nineteen ninety? Well, man, to buy every Lego set released that year, and there were one hundred and twenty four of them, it would have cost you thirteen hundred dollars. Like. I feel like it would probably cost you, I mean, we can look it up. I, I can pull the data. We have it here. But I can already tell you it costs you more than that to buy every single Star Wars set from last year. <laughs> you know? So it, it's definitely gotten more expensive over time. In fact, since 1990, it's almost, I mean, it's it's almost, what, what, what would the word be? 30, it's 30 times. I was, I was trying to think of, you know, it's not tripled. It's It's 30 times more expensive to buy every single set and uh, for eight times as many sets but Two. exactly for eight times as many sets so just looking at the retail price alone doesn't necessarily tell you if lego's getting more expensive i will say looking at this list i don't know about you it gives me a lot more respect for jang bricks who actually goes out and buys all these sets with his own money to review them because holy crap <laughs> yeah i thought i spent a lot of money on lego but yeah, it would be $30,000 this past year if you wanted to buy every single 2023 Lego set. Mm, so what's the conclusion for all the land guys out there who are not buying their Lego sets? Legos purchased them. No, I mean, look, I think, I think to be honest, I think anybody who buys, you know, if you were to build a Lego set that was given to you for free, I could look at it and be like, I would never spend $200 on that. Because I know how much two hundred dollars is to me, at least, right? So, yeah. Uh, but but what I do think is interesting about this data is is it for me at least anecdotally, it's felt like the last few years. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's been so many more Lego sets than have ever been released, and it's kind of true. I mean, 2021 and 22 were big years. There was 900 plus sets released in both those years. But realistically, since about 2015, I mean, there was only 60 sets more released in 2023 than there were in 2015 right so it's for me at least the last couple years i've been like holy crap there's a lot of lego sets but like actually looking at the numbers sure there was 100 more lego sets last year and the year before than there were in 2023 or in 2020 but realistically it's been pretty stable the past you know decade or, or you know half decade right you know and interestingly enough too looking at the data it looks like you could take away potentially a little inside baseball here. You know, we went from 906 sets in 2022 to 801 sets in 2021. I wonder if, and we kind of know this to be the case, but it would probably tell us like, why would there be such a dip? Right. And one of the conclusions that we could potentially take away, can't prove this necessarily without additional evidence is that lego's on a three-year production cycle and so in 2023 three years after 2020 the number of sets have gone down because of what occurred in 2020 and that kind of makes sense actually 
Um, if you think, think about, about that way, yeah. you know, different uh, economic constraints, social constraints, and other constraints on the production environment, uh, why this year, and, and I would imagine 2024, we'll probably start to see that number of sets go back up, I would imagine. Yeah, it's already slowly. at like 400, but I feel like it's kind of hard to tell because that also includes unreleased sets. So yeah. it's just anything that's been announced up until this point. So yeah. even even sitting here being like, oh my God, it's already at 400 and it's only like February. Like you can't necessarily do that because it, that could have stuff that's been announced for October, right? Like Wicked, for right. example, was just announced and that those sets come out in October. There's four sets. So it's just, it's a little too difficult to do for 2024 currently. One, well, and we know too that like the release year for Lego gets kind of slower as the year goes on, right? So by the end of the year, they're not as, you know, we have a January wave, we have a March wave, we have a May wave, an August wave, mm-hmm. like a September wave. And then that that's kind of it for the end of the year. We've just kind of started to get now a December wave. Uh, but, you know, like with the modular buildings, that takes yeah. away from the previous year. And so like the the library or the, the museum rather being released in 2023 was sort of a, a new thing where uh, there wasn't a 2024 January modular release. And so right. there's that one uh, double year now, but it's exactly. going to be pulled forward every year. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and two, um, there's always that kind of like black Friday set, like Avengers towers. They typically have, I mean, a few years ago, it was like more Batman based. They always had like the Tumblr or something coming around yeah. that time. So you are right. It's not a traditional, like, Hey, here's a new wave of Lego sets. It's here's the new random set to like, everybody's already spent all their money. We want to get you to buy one more $600 set before the end of the year. <laughs> and by yeah, God, it yeah. works. Um, so yeah, if you just if you just look at the data over time, the kind of conclusion here is yes, it will cost you more money per year now to collect every single Lego set. However, the number of Lego sets has also increased and it's been proportional to the amount of you know, money that you need to spend on Lego, right? Or the amount of money you need to spend on Lego has been proportional to the sets going up. So let's take it another step lower, right? Or, or for a step further down. And when we look at the average price per set over time, um, so what this is looking at is in 2020, a set on average costs $45. In 2023, a set on average costs $63, right? In 2022, though, on average, a set costs $25. So what we're finding from the data is before 2019, or 2017, I should say, the average price per set was relatively stable over time. In the 90s, uh, between 90 and 2000, it was somewhere around 30, high 20s and 30s. But then between 2000 and 2015, all of a sudden it was definitely kind of still that 30 range, but maybe creeping up to like low 30s. I mean, it got up to like $38 at one point in 2007, $36, $36. I think, was it 2007? Was that the first UCS Millennium Falcon? Just Ooh, saying. I'd have to go back and Just check. saying. It's one yeah. of those years there. But then very recently, it's gone up to $64, right? So in 2022 and 2023, it was $64 and $63 respectively. And in 2021, it was $50. So what's the takeaway from, from the average price per set? you know, comparison here. Yeah, it's not, again, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's still a little bit inconclusive. I mean, it is saying, Hey, Lego sets themselves are getting more expensive. What it's not saying is it costs more money to get a Lego piece, right? It's, if we'd start to, we're going to, we're going to, now we're going to, you know, take it an even step further and we're going to look at um, also the number of pieces per set. So again, Right. Well, now we'll now we'll look at how, you know, we talked about the price. Let's look at the number of pieces. And it's it's interesting. It's a little the graph is a little bit more extreme and a little bit more waved. Right. When it comes to this, whereas definitely the average price per set's a little just kind of more up and down by year. And then it trends up. This is more of like it goes up and then it comes down, goes up. And it kind of I, I guess I'm saying that because it kind of kind of leads to your thought of how sets are actually getting you know, maybe they're on like a three or four year cycle here when it comes to planning. Um, but Wes, do you have the average piece 
price per uh, sorry pieces per set in front of you. Do you have any takeaways yep. here? I mean, I have I have kind of a conclusion for the two graphs together, but uh, certainly we're seeing, like you said, the average pieces start to slowly increase. 2007 was a high point in the in the 2000s at 428 pieces per set mm -hmm. uh and then as we get into the 2020s that average increases you know significantly but for a while like you said with the price one it stays fairly consistent in in terms of like an average somewhere in like maybe the mid 300s yeah. up until um you know 2015 and then we start to see a, a climb in the sets so uh was there anything else you had for for those two before we kind of get into maybe a conclusive thought or a thesis from what we're seeing in front of us yeah i think you you kind of alluded to it earlier when we talked about rock raiders and how simple those sets were right of like yep. a lot of them were like under 50 bucks if that, there was like one over fifty dollars for that matter, and they all had like a hundred something random pieces, two hundred pieces in it, and that's what I mean. That's what we see in the data too. So like, just kind of doing that anecdotal gut check of like, this is what we feel, this is what we see, right? So it's like, yes, that kind of checks out. And yeah, if we look at nineteen ninety nine, right, average pieces per set, one hundred sixty six, right, and then like you mentioned, it just kind of skyrockets here. Um, and interestingly, too, you know, we'll get into the price per part here because I'm just I'm, I'm I'm looking a little ahead here. I've got all the data in front of me. Um, but before we talk about it, uh, Wes, I want you to look at the average price per part. And, and there's a specific yeah. year that I'm looking at where the price per part jumps significantly. And it's probably not, you know, if you're listening, I want you to guess what year you think I'm talking about. It might not be the one that you think. Or as or or as like recent as you think, right? And when you look at the other two graphs, though, Wes, do you see that same spike in the average price per set and the average pieces per set? I don't. I yeah, don't it's kind of interesting. It definitely stands out. Yeah. So, uh, Wes, let's have you walk through the average price per part, and uh, so that's what we're looking at, right? How much a piece would cost if you said, okay. Uh, I bought a Lego set for hundred dollars and I had a thousand pieces. Right? How much each yeah. one of those pieces would be ten cents? So, what's the average price per part uh, chart show you? Yeah, I mean, just looking at the average price per part, right? We we actually see that it's fairly consistent. Yes, since the nineteen nineties, the prices have gone up. In the in the early nineties till about nineteen ninety eight, we're sitting around the twelve cents, thirteen cents price per part ratio. So what's interesting here, right, is it's still above the 10 benchmark, the 10 cent benchmark that we seem to all believe is the correct indicator for or the the what we would believe is the a value or, you know, a, a, a good of good value for the consumer. Right. So even in the 90s, we were sitting above the 10 cents mark. But one of the major jumps occurs between 1998 and 1999, where it goes from 12 cents to 22 cents. And we see a similar jump here between 2009 and 2010 when it goes to 14 to 21. And those jumps are not actually annotated or, or copied in the average price per set and average pieces per set charts that we have as well. And so uh, I think that, like you said, that's a really interesting um, jump there when we don't actually see a similar jump elsewhere. But what, what I, does stand out to me, and I'll kind of share my final conclusion, is we see a kind of a plateau in the 90s, and we see a plateau in the late 2010s, early 2020s, sitting around about 18, maybe 19 cents price per part. And so I think, you know, conclusively, if that is our measurement, right, which we said may or may not actually be a good measure of LEGO value, we're seeing a fairly consistent value for LEGO over about a decade in both cases. Uh, and so... I don't know if someone were to say today Lego is getting more expensive, I probably would say that's not actually correct based on what we're seeing in front of us. Yeah, and now being a data nerd, I like to try to poke holes in the data. So I'm going to try to poke a hole in this and then I have a follow-up point. And I haven't I've, you've seen all this data, right? You saw this beforehand, but you I don't think you saw this next piece. I kind of kept this hidden from you. So I want your kind of raw reaction here. 
the one issue with looking at it this way is that this is the average average price per part. So for example, if you have a set that's got 10, you know, 10 pieces per part, 10 price per part, and you got one that's 20, your average is 15, right? So this is taking mm -hmm. an average of that average price per part, right? It's an average of the you know, price per part ratio, so to speak. Sure. What I've done in the next way to look at the true value of a Lego part over time is uh, I've got another little column on here, uh, West. And if you don't mind looking at the one that says price per part by year, what this is showing us is the total number of pieces that were released in a year. So, for example, in 1992, there was a total of 8,529 pieces released. And I mean, if you bought every single set. And it would have cost you, you know, a thousand something dollars, right? So I've looked at looked at it that way. So if you took, if you went and bought every single set that was released in a year and dumped them all out in a giant bin, it would have cost you, there would be this many parts there and it would have cost this much dollars, right? This much money. And yeah, can you tell me, is this getting more expensive or less expensive over time? <laughs> well, this is, this is a great, I mean, isn't uh, this crazy? <laughs> yeah, it's it's really neat to look at. Um, for the listener, what we're finding is that essentially the price per part is stuck around ten cents price per part. I mean, fairly consistently. Maybe on average, it's probably closer to like eleven or twelve cents per part. But over a year, over the years, it has been consistent and never going above. I think the highest I'm seeing is fifteen. Uh, cents per part in 1991 and so um, yeah I mean I think the conclusive takeaway from this is that Lego itself in terms of the price per piece right has actually stayed fairly consistent um, regardless of the number of sets or the number of pieces or the perceived increase in, in value so. yeah ex exactly so what what we're kind of looking at here is is just the price to part over time of like the absolute kind of value, right? Uh, so to speak of like every single part. And yeah, like you mentioned, it's, 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 it's like, you know, for the start of the, the 1990s, it's like, you know, there's nothing, none of them are 10, right? And then all of a sudden the 2000s roll around and we have a couple of years that it goes under nine cents per piece. And then we have a couple yeah. of years, it goes back up a little bit, right? And then it goes back down a little bit more recently, which is crazy to think like when we looked at it earlier, right? If we looked at 2023, for example, it, it cost $30,000 to buy every single set. But the price of the actual Lego bricks in those sets is cheaper than it was, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, 10 years ago. Well, and, and that makes sense because, you know, we talked about it a little bit, right? But like Lego is a company over time in order to stay profitable is going to continue to try to be more and more efficient right or they're going to have to release newer themes to bring more people into the market and so we've seen the number of themes definitely increase since the early 90s i mean i don't need a chart or numbers in front of me to, to make that statement we know that to be true right so we're seeing more themes coming into the into the play so certainly there's going to be more sets there's going to be more pieces but those numbers show us that Lego, even with those increases in sets, has maintained essentially uh, an efficiency in production. So the, the price per piece is consistent. I mean, it, it's really fascinating to see that. I would like to see if any factory openings end up playing into imp impact in, in some of these years. You know, they just opened up a factory in Virginia. There's a factory, I believe, in Mexico. There's obviously yeah. the one in Denmark. I think that, one that would Czech affect Republic. more of like their P&L. Right. Sure. And then, and but then, certainly an efficiency for production, right? Right. So when you you're can... looking at your price modeling, it'll, yeah. But, but that's so more just... of to keep up with demand, right? Right. Ex right. Absolutely. So it's fascinating to see kind of how that plays out and, and how consistent that's been over time. So, I mean, I, I think the takeaway here, you know, without a doubt, is that Lego is, is staying consistently, you know, fairly valued and fairly close to like that 13 cents price per piece that um, that we talked about. You know, I think you saw what I kind of did over here in the next column is I did a couple things. I took 
the total data. So again, we we're looking at this by year right now. And I'm I'm like, this is like such copium for any priced apart person that's like, aha, I told you it was 10 cents per part. Um, no, you didn't. You didn't have this data. I'm giving you this. We're giving you this data. Um, I, I took this by decade, right? So 1990, the decade, you know, if, if you, you know, what, what I was saying is we kind of counted up every single piece in that year if you bought every single set and then like looked at the price to part that way. I did the same thing for the decade and I did the same thing for this entire data set. And can you guess <laughs> what this data set shook out to be? <laughs> 10 cents per I mean, part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, so. God damn it. <laughs> They're right. <laughs> They're right. And they didn't even have to do this analysis. But but no, so actually 1999 or the 1990s, it was 12 cents per part. The 2000s, 2000 to 2009, it was 10 cents. So it went down. 2010 to 2019, it was 11 cents. And then 2020 and beyond so far, this, these last couple of years, has been 10 cents. And if you take the yeah. entire data set with that same methodology, it's 10 cents per part. Yeah. I mean, it. yeah, it, it is. It, it's surprising. And I... Yeah. <laughs> so I I do want to say though, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, this still isn't necessarily a good way to judge a value of a set on the market. What this does not mean is this does not mean that most of the sets are going to have 10 cents per part. That's for looking at that other chart is better to show you better value of the average price per part per set, right? What this is saying is the actual price of a Lego piece isn't necessarily going down or, or going up. What this is more showing is, you know, that that's relatively stable, right? But you've got to consider right. this is also considering the fact that you bought Rivendell that has 6,000 pieces and then you bought that, you know, that Jurassic Park set that does not have, you know, that has a poor price to part ratio. So this is just purely looking at the price of the bricks that are available that year and the price, you know, the, par the price for those, right? So with that in mind, Going back to the original data sets we were looking at, the, the conclusion that I wanted to draw with the average pieces per set and the average price per set is it's, it's actually kind of neat. If you take the two graphs, and we don't have the ability to necessarily do that here on Google Sheets, maybe we do, maybe we don't, but if we overlapped them, you, can. you would see that they, I mean, just by looking at them, they look fairly similar, these right. two charts. They both peak around 2000, uh, the mid-90s, they peak around the mid 2000s and then they peak around 2022 and 2023 respectively. And so what the conclusion that tells us, right, is that we're seeing an, a significant increase in the average pieces per set in the late 2020s and early 20 uh, or sorry, late 20 teens in the early 2020s. And we're seeing a similar increase in price per set in the late 20 teens and early 2020s. So that kind of supports the conclusion that we talked about in the beginning of this podcast that we're seeing more sets with higher piece counts in them than ever before right this is the these are the years where the lego eiffel tower was released the lego titanic was released the map of the world was released and and so it makes sense the lego hogwarts express right the hogwarts castle like all of these really big sets designed for adults we're seeing a, the conclusion we can draw is knowing that that has been Lego's production process or sort of direction, that the average pieces per set corroborates that, right? It, it agrees with that because we're seeing the number of pieces go up. And, and the average price per set also is going up. And so it's consistent. The price per part, though, is staying relatively stable. Yeah. Absolutely. So in fact, is, it's going down in right. 2022 and 2023. Is Lego getting more expensive for the pieces or are they just making bigger sets? More expensive sets. Exactly. Bigger yeah. and more expensive sets. Bingo. Boom. And, and I, I, I could have anecdotally told you that, right? But we've got the <laughs> data here to back that up. Right. So, well, and, and that was our that was our soft thesis at the beginning of this podcast, a hypothesis, right? right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah that we believed that what we were actually seeing was not the price, the value of Lego increasing, 
or the the cost of Lego increasing, but rather we're seeing more expensive sets and bigger sets that are coming out, you know, at a increased rate, which is why as an adult, it feels like Lego is getting more expensive. Right. So as you mentioned, they just opened all these plants. So guess what? We need to sell more larger Lego sets. And do you know why you have wallet fatigue? It's not because <laughs> the, you know, it cost me 15 cents per this brick. It's because I had to go buy a $600 Lego set three times this year because I'm a Star Wars collector and they've got three, you know, I guess they don't have three UCS sets, but they had two UCS sets that were all $600, right? Like that's the yeah. biggest difference. So um, yeah. any other conclusions here before I move on to one thing? Uh, I mean, that that was the big takeaway that I wanted to talk to, to just reinforce that point. Um, so I'll turn over the discussion to you, Grinch, with well, whatever so, else you have. So quick question, then. If you're sitting at the shelf and you're like, oh, my gosh, this this Lego set has a price to part ratio of 15 cents per piece. Are you happy with that or set? I mean, I I'm a lot like you. I don't I don't sit there and look at price per piece in yeah. terms of value. I I buy the Lego sets that I want that I think are interesting. Uh that doesn't mean that I buy every single Lego set that I want or think is interesting. I buy um, all the ones that I want. <laughs> um you know, it's just one of those things where there's like a threshold part of it and you know, like you're dealing with it now is moving is it a you know, a collector of Lego, and that has yeah. certainly this year shaped my approach to what I will buy and won't buy, and then just the space that it takes up. And um, so, yeah, no, price per piece isn't something that I'm focused on when I buy a set. The data would tell you though that a fifteen price per part ratio of fifteen or less is actually it's pretty good. Is actually yeah. below average. So, uh, yeah. just wanted to clarify when we look at the average price per part per set you're targeting around 18. Now, when you when you take all the prices and you take all the parts and combine them into one number for the year, that's when you start to get to that 10 cents mark, right? So maybe Lego is yeah. internally like, hey guys, we got to keep it here. However, you know, for every every Jurassic Park set that you buy that's got 40 uh, or four, 400 pieces for an $80 price tag, and when you as soon as you buy one Rivendell that's got 6,000 pieces for a Four hundred dollar price tag or whatever it is, you're making up for that, right? So, sure. Over time, it might get to like ten cents per part if you look at it that way. But looking at a you know a single set on the shelf and then comparing that price to that point isn't necessarily fair, right? Based off this data. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anything else there, there, West? And then I've got. To, I want to move on to one more thing before we kind of wrap it up. Um, no, and I, I do. You talked about this already, though, right? You talked about the secondhand market and the value of sets going from there, and that's where I think we really start to see. And that's a whole separate discussion. You know, we are talking about value analysis, though, in this episode, and so, you know, I I think it's actually a little clearer in that case, right? We do see it's very straightforward. It's a, it's an equation of scarcity. The scarcer a Lego part is, the more that it's valued in comparison mm -hmm. to a similarly, uh, you know, a similar piece, maybe of a different color or print. And so um, I don't think there's any huge takeaways there other than now that Lego owns BrickLink, certainly they, you know, probably could future cast a little bit on like the the potential, you know, forecasted values of their sets yeah. uh, as they release them, which is maybe a little scary to think about. A terrifying. Um, Oh my so, gosh, could you some, imagine? You, somebody, I, I didn't want to get into it because like, you know, like whenever you're on Reddit, do you ever like start dip, writing dip something? Your toe, Grinch, dip your toe. Yeah, do you ever start like writing something on Reddit and then you're just like, <laughs> uh, no, I don't want to get into this with this internet stranger. Like they, they'll never understand what I'm trying to say. So somebody was like complaining about BrickLink and how Lego bought them to like make sure Lego's values spewed out to the entire community because I don't agree with Lego's values. So they're turning off any custom military vehicles because Lego hates us. I'm like, no, they bought BrickLink because they have a, a data mine of information. They have a gold mine of what oh people God, are yeah. willing to pay for a set and how many people are willing to pay for that set. And also like, you know, they could go back and look, wow, Castle is really popular right now. We've sold more Castle on BrickLink in the past six, you know, six years than we have ever sold. You know, you know like it, it's really just a huge, companies are starting to try to get data, 
right? And Bricklink is just this ginormous source of data for yeah. I mean, how, how much people are willing to pay on a dinosaur, right? Of even a set that's retail today, because yeah. guess what? A, a Bricklink reseller will go buy that set and then they part it out and then they put the dinosaur on the market for 30 bucks. So now Lego's like, okay, cool. People value these at 30 bucks. We had it at 10. <laughs> now it's 30. <laughs> yeah, right. No, it, it is scary to think about. And, and certainly, I mean, as a company, I think Lego's uh, corporate values have been pretty spot on uh, and, and pretty solid, you know? Uh, very consistent. At the same time, yeah, and, and very consistent. And so I would hope that, you know, that the utility of this information is, is such that, like you said, identifying themes that are still playing well today, no pun intended, um, that, that they could maybe tap back into uh, for nostalgia purposes or just, you know, as a refresh or something like that. You know, we, we know things like the, the Lego Trains theme has been, you know, e extremely well valued on the secondary and, and markets and there's a lot of builders who, who pine for that kind of older Lego trains days. The castle theme has certainly been one of them. You've seen the release of these nostalgic sets with the space release, the castle release, and the um, El Dorado Fortress release. And and But you and I have talked about it. They're crushing it. I mean, all of those sets were wonderful sets. And so if that's what the brick set acquisition leads to, more just really awesome sets that are kind of throwback sets, hey, Lego... Go forth and conquer, my friends. That I'm, I welcome it. Did Did you really not intend to use that pun? Because like that was pretty good. Oh, I, maybe a little bit. Oh, did you, were you sitting on that for like a whole hour? I, I wasn't. I wasn't. So. Oh, did you come up with that it, off it the just, cuff? It's kind of, it, you know, it's it's being a dad. Dad jokes. They just they it becomes a little more natural. Hats off to you, sir. I'll get there one day. Uh, all right. So last thing, uh, if you go to sheet three. There, Wes. Okay. I did want to just show you. Um, I took every single theme and I did the same exercise of you know piece piece you know average piece count, average price, average price to part, and we talked a little bit about it of Disney tax. And now this is looking totally over time, right? I think I think you know if I were to be critical of my own work here, one a better way to look at it would be when did Disney acquire? Star Wars, and you can't even necessarily look at it as the acquire point. Maybe when did Disney put their logo on the Lego boxes? Um, but a few notable things that are above Star Wars here, um, there's over a hundred themes on this list. I've got I've got 122 total themes here. And Star Wars is theme number 62. So it's right in the middle of the pack here with an average price to part ratio of 13 cents per part. Now this does not in incorporate ties. You know, if, if you wanted to do like a rank function, you could because technically number 62 is also equivalent to number 53, right? So technically sure. this is the 53th most expensive, but notable sets or notable themes that I see in this area, Marvel, they're owned by Disney, oh my gosh, DC, the Hobbit, Power Miners, um, Cars, Scooby-Doo, Avatar is cheaper at twelve cents. But one of the one of the themes we talked about, actually two of the themes that we talked about when we did our practice episodes, were Western and Rock Raiders, and they're at sixteen parts uh, uh, price per part. So that's three cents or higher than Star Wars. Or one of Lego's, you know, just hallmark themes that they've created themselves, Ninjago, at 17 cents price Correct. per part. Now, the, the Which, larger city sets are good there, right? But I think yeah, city's go shown 22. So wow, so city and and you get a lot of big. They've got the the um, the new road plates that come in some of these sets. They have a lot mm -hmm. of times we'll have animals, right, with like the Arctic set or something or the safari sets or whatever. Um, but then they'll also have a lot of like prefabricated large pieces for their planes. And then yeah. um, any anything else that Super Mario is pretty high, actually, 22 cents uh, per on average price per part. Yeah, I mean, Bionicle's up there. Um it, it is it's pretty insane how uh some of these you know i i think really the takeaway here right is that like 
there isn't a quote unquote Lego or a Disney tax that you're paying. The right. the reality is that in fact it's probably one of the better values than some of the other themes. And and certainly there's some outliers, right? Like I'm looking at Speed or Stranger Things and that's at nine cents. Well they had what two sets? There's only one because so like, those those other ones are brickheads. I guess those are brickheads. Yeah, so this so, is only I mean, that one set, set right? Yeah. You would technically throw really, that out, right? A great example of a theme. But when you look at again, going back to like the Ninjago and Star Wars, you know, certainly Star Wars has released more sets, mm-hmm. but you know, Ninjago has released a lot of sets too, and so that's where we can really have like a fairly good comparison of. Uh, you know, truly to see if if a quote unquote IP, you know, theme is actually um, you know more expensive than a theme that Lego creates themselves. And, uh, and I, I think I, that I thought you were going to go here with Ninjago, but they'll do um, like I feel like every every year or so, or they used to when it first came out, they'll do like the spinners or the yeah. Stuff oh, I didn't like that. So that, no, I wasn't even. Yeah, that absolutely point. increases that that price to part. So there could be a little bit of noise there. But, you know, it, when you talk to a Lego Star Wars collector, I'm not going to name any YouTubers or anything like that. But when you talk to them, it's like the end of freaking times over here because Star Wars has got this price to part ratio it was 20 cents in this one set. And now it's ruined. And it's just simply not true. Yeah. No, and, absolutely. And Western absolutely. and Rock Raiders, they came out in 1999, right? I mean, Jurassic look at Bionicle, World. right? Yeah, and I almost wanted to like remove Bionicle because it's a whole different system, but I kept it in here because I know there's. But I, I wanted to like, you know, keep, you know, keep it kind of keep it within. Sure. I wanted to see kind of where it, where it landed. Um, like Technic, Technic's at 13 cents, so it's tied yeah. with Star Wars. So like, and and sure, there's some big Technic pieces. But there's also a crap ton of small technic pieces. Right. So like, it's not you know it's hard to the data is the data, and right. the, you know we're we're just interpreting it, not not necessarily making educated guesses here, right? Like it's it's pretty clear what we're seeing, which there, is there are over like forty thousand sets in this data set. <laughs> like this is not yeah. like. <laughs> I mean, the Stranger Things was a one-off, but there I, I, actually it might be twenty thousand. But there's a lot of data here, right? Um, sure. Because this is the internet, and people love to know like what the top and what the the bottom is. Uh, trains has the worst price to part ratio. Now that data set needs to be cleaned up a little bit, but it makes sense because you've got the big track pieces. Those have historically terrible price to part ratios. I tried to pull out sure. like the motors. And, you know, they had like a console that was like $40 for that one. And it was technically a Lego piece for the electrical console for the nine volt. I pulled that out, but definitely there could still be some inflation because of stuff like that, the more mechanical side of things, but that's at a whole dollar per part. Uh, Ben 10, you could argue should have been removed because that was like a, um, like a Jack Stone style where they had like larger figures. They weren't mini figures. They were more of like, more of like the four plus kind of Duplo stuff. Uh, but CMF, if you look at the uh, the themes that are on the shelf today, CMF has the worst. And that makes sense, right? It's like $6 for a minifigure that usually comes with like five pieces. Um, um, what surprised me was extra. I see you hovering on it. But those are, remember, those are the little like piece packs where they came right, out with right. like, you know, they had a winter one and a summer one and a, you know, that kind of surprised me. That's 53 cents per part. Yeah, it's it's pretty insane that, that those are so much, you know. But certainly, there's a scarcity with the pieces they're offering too, and so I imagine that's probably goes into Lego's perspective of a why they even created the park packs to begin with, and then b why they're priced the way they are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, for Lego, these are probably going to be margin drivers. You know, you think of like a candy and, and a grocery store where it's like you just want to like put something on there that's going to be like, ooh, I want that. So that, you know, when somebody's checking out, they're like, ooh, that looks cool. And then they yeah. just, you know, they're, you're, yeah. oh, it's only eight bucks, whatever. Um, right. Yeah. The average uh, retail price on extras, seven ninety nine. I believe they're all seven ninety nine. <laughs> yeah. And you get like a couple of fences, you know, some lamp posts and like a dog. And it's like, oh, great. Like, you know, you're like, oh, I wanted those. And but like you're saying, like the value of that actually is pretty terrible. 
Um, but it's it's yeah, it's it's the candy at the end of the checkout aisle, and you're just sort of sitting there at the grocery store, staring at all the food in front of you, going like, oh, that you know that Snickers bar looks pretty good. Like I'll throw that on there. I too. just complained about the price of apples for an hour to my my wife, who's not listening to me, but. That that five dollars for that Snicker bar is totally worth it, isn't it? <laughs> That's not a real story. Um, no, but so going to the opposite end of the spectrum here, uh, Lego art is traditionally the best value, which makes sense, right? Those are like the mosaics um, mm-hmm. with, at four cents per piece. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't even like those art sets. We're talking about value here. Like when I look at those things, I'm like. It's still not worth it for me half the time, you know, like the Iron Man art set was like, you know, a hundred bucks for like this Iron Man. And it, and it was a fantastic part to price ratio, but um, I don't really value that set. But look at like Speed Champion or Creator too, right? Both yeah. at eight cents, which is Speed Champion, right? You're taking licensed vehicles. You're paying for a license for Ferrari. Like and- it's not like disney you know and what don't, I mean? don't like, they sometimes have like sub like sub themes on them too like they'll have like maybe i don't know if they'll have like a shell logo but like maybe a tire company like uh goodyear or somebody like that aren't they sometimes on there yeah i mean there's certainly some of the stickers so i yeah. would imagine they're having That's, to pay unless gotta be a licensing they're creating fee. yeah like one-offs or something or if they're licensing with like nascar and it, so yeah, like it could come from you know like the I mean? overall agreement of like the material the source material Sure, sure. But but still, I mean, you know, and, and we're talking about car companies here that, that are, you know, making million dollar cars. Like, it's not like, I mean, I guess a movie is expensive, but like, you, you'd think that like a luxury brand like Lamborghini probably would have a higher licensing fee than like, you know. Yeah star wars toys for action figures but but no not at all now speed champion the prices are going up they are so and but maybe, maybe that again just maybe, reactionary because i haven't looked at the pieces and i haven't looked at uh the graph over time so maybe that's one we can look at after the show uh breaking that theme down a little more well i think um you know i think we're doing the job of some intern right now at Lego and they're probably doing this right now too. And be like, I yeah, get hey, two Lego, more cents you out wanna, of the... <laughs> you know, throw us a discount code or something. We'd appreciate it. Give us some points in our, uh, our, uh, um, Lego insiders accounts. Lego already knows how much I spend on Lego because I have a Lego account. So like they know how much I spend. Yeah. So like you guys yeah. can just go there and you'll, you'll, you'll find out Lego. Um, <laughs> all right. Did you have any other key take? I, I, this was, We'll probably not go this long on our conversations in the future. It's just there's a lot here to unpack. Uh, you know, you, there's just a lot kind of surrounding this conversation, right? That that we, I mean, we could probably talk for another hour about value because again, so much of it's subjective. So I know we got a little bit long winded here, but um, before we move on to our next segment, uh, West, is there anything else you wanted to touch on? No, I'll just say I think we can pull our audience and if they think that a conversation, you know, purely about brickonomics is worthwhile in the future, then then we can have that discussion. And by brickonomics, I mean like the the buying and selling of bulk Lego on Bricklink uh, and the value associated with that. Because, again, kind of you set the scope of our conversation today, you know, uh, fairly specifically, and, and it gets out of scope of our conversation um, but I think still very much a worthwhile topic. So mm-hmm. listeners, if, if you'd like to hear about Brickonomics, let us know in the comments uh, and we can consider that for a future episode. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I, I wanted to be very clear, right, that we're not necessarily talking about like, oh, well, if you buy this set, it could be this much in the future. We're purely talking about the price on the shelf, right? So good absolutely. Point. What are we building? All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on to our next segment of the show. Uh, This is What Are We Building? And uh, being the first episode, Wes, do you want to just kind of share what we'll kind of talk about in this this portion? Yeah, this is just a brief kind of segment for us to just chat on what what we're building this week. You know, um, it's just a quick catch up and, uh, you know, pretty low key, ultimately. It's not meant to be, uh, you know, any, any... deep dives or heavy hitting uh, analysis here so um i'll just start off with i haven't built anything this week i know i've been a bad uh, adult fan of lego 
We're going to um, disown you. Um, in fact, <laughs> if you hit the hang up button, you can leave the call and just yeah, delete this I'm, number. I'm done off the podcast. Um, but I did just order the corrected tiles for the Orient Express. Um, if you actually, uh, Jang just released his review of it today. He goes into those details. Uh, if you go to, I think it was either Brickset or uh, if you just search uh, Lego Orient Express corrected tiles, there's articles on it online. You just have to call Lego and they'll get you those. So if you got the early production run, uh, Bucharest um, spelled and pronounced Bucharesti on the tile was spelled incorrectly. And then um, Munich or Munchen on the tile is it. That is the pronunciation as it looks. Uh, certainly not the correct pronunciation. I apologize. Um, needs an umlaut over the U and is missing. And so uh, collectible for those of us who got the initial run. Um, but yeah, Lego will send away. you the correct. Yes, no, definitely not. Okay. Lego will you send you the correct tiles for free. So um, if you like the corrected ones, hit them up and they will send them your way. Awesome. Um, yeah. So uh, did you enjoy the Orient Express when you built you, your you have that done, I assume? I do. I do. And we did talk about that in one of our practice episodes, but um, I, I did enjoy the build. I had a, maybe a different take than Jang did. We're going to talk about that later. Um, Grinch, what are you building this week? Uh, it looks like I also have to leave the podcast because I didn't build anything this week. In my oh. defense, I'm selling my house and moving, so there's that. Um, I'm also doing two jobs right Buy now, so that's fun. I bought a lot of Lego this week because I tend to do oh. that when I'm stressed out. Uh, I made sure I got the gift with purchase for the Space Babies. Got two of those because I also went to the Lego store to get something. Um, I did buy the Disney 100 uh, camera. Uh, I, I do think Brickonomics here, that'll be super collectible someday because it does come with a Walt Disney figure. Only set that has a Walt Disney figure. So traditionally, like the the... Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse brickheads are all of a sudden like, I think they're like 80 bucks now a piece. And those oh were 10, gosh. like in, like Disney is insane. So I did get that because I think it's a cool set. I like, I just like the kind of old fashioned camera. And then on top of that, I was like, well, yeah, I might actually, that might be a set that I actually go buy a couple more of. I don't typically do that, but I might just buy a couple to just have because I could honestly foresee that set selling for like, Honestly, two hundred dollars a year after it retires, and then like in five yeah. years, it could probably peak around three fifty. It really probably could. Um, but no, I did. I you know we talked a lot about the value of Lego today. I want to just talk quickly about the appreciation for Lego here. What an easy to do business with company. I mean, you said it like they made a mistake with the with this, these stickers, or were they prints? Or stickers. They were prints. Yes, they were. they were. They did have an issue with the sticker sheet in the Orient Express too. So just real quick, while we're on the topic, if you got the Sapphire Star stickers and they are in Kitar or Flame Orange, uh, they're supposed to be in a uh, gold, right? Gold foil, yeah. and so you can talk to Lego and they'll send you new stickers. And and funny enough, in Jang's video, he got like every other sticker sheet except for the right one. So at this point, he has like seven sticker sheets, but finally got the correct one. I got the correct one in mind, so it's not necessarily a first production run. That seems to be more isolated than the misprints on mm. the tiles. But exactly your point. like th they, they just, just fixed it. Yep, it took two minutes on the phone, yeah. and they're like, there they go. And then I got an email saying, we're sending you your, your new pieces. I mean, it, just incredible how like yeah. easygoing those guys are with with those kind of things. So, so I was gonna build the hot dog cart, which is Ooh, how I got here. Yeah, the, yeah that gift with purchase, but it I've never got a Lego set that didn't have the sticker sheet. I haven't either. And this the the my hot dog gift with purchase did not have it. It just wasn't there. No way. And so I I like I went page by page to the instructions. I was gonna build it because I just wanted to do a small set, you know wasn't there so i literally i just went under bricks and pieces said i didn't get it and they're just like here you go and it got here yesterday so while we're on the topic i have a quick story uh years ago i got the lego seasonal the holiday season the firehouse and i was missing like an entire bag they basically just put two of the same bag in there instead of like another one mm -hmm. and so i'm building this thing and i'm like I remember that yeah you know, missing a piece and I'm like, what the heck? And then I go and I, I build it again and I'm like trying to figure that out and I'm missing another piece. And I'm like, you know, it's very rare that you A are missing a piece, let alone two. 
Not a whole bag. Yeah, a whole bag. And and it was like a smaller bag. And I think they were either similarly weighted or something. But I essentially got two of the same bag and not the other. And so I just call them up and they're like, okay, we'll send it to you. And it just, you know, a kind of a weird conversation on the phone. You're like, yeah, like the entire bag is missing. <laughs> um, but you know, they figured it out. They they did what was right. And um, it just, again, like, what a awesome company. They just, no questions asked, we'll hook you up. Now, if you put nail polish or Sharpie on a Lego piece and then call them and say hey, it's broken, they uh, generally will not hook you up, uh, as I did learn how, when how I do you know that? your your clone minifigures from the original ATTE, which I need to buy you the new helmets. So do we, do we finally have a, you know... Are admission you, of guilt yeah are you uh, yeah i mean i think the statue of limitations has run out on it but i i will i will buy you the new helmet or the old helmets hmm. all right i'll have to look up other statue of limitations and see how long <laughs> i need to no uh anyway so um so that's our, our what are we building section where we kind of talk about just our like recent you know experiences with lego over the past week since our last episode uh because we are two absolute addicts and we are always doing something with lego um so the next portion that we would typically move to would be our brick mail uh but we don't have it in this section because this is literally our first episode uh but west what is kind of the brick mail section hey it's just a way for our listeners to send us in comments reviews uh positive vibes uh you know maybe some constructive criticism uh certainly we will uh address that um and appreciate it uh if you're watching on youtube and think west needs to save shave his mustache just give this video a like if it gets a thousand likes we'll go ahead and shave it like and subscribe and uh yeah we'll see what we can do um no it's just a way for our listeners to to reach out and be a part of the show too and share some of their experiences certainly uh, depending on how much the volume of, of brick mail we get, we won't be able to necessarily share everything. Uh, so I, apologies if we ever miss something, uh, but we do want to give uh, our listeners a chance to, to be a part of the show. Yeah, let us know your thought. How do you value Lego? How do you kind of look yeah. at, you know, do you, do you use price to part as like your, you know, kind of guidebook of Lego value or do you use something else? Let us know. Uh, always curious to hear about that. So, and that's a wrap of uh, uh, our first episode of A Falls Welcome. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you're listening to this show. If you would like to write us, please email us at afallswelcome at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram at afallswelcome. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you in the next one.